And let's continue with the tenth chapter of Greenwich. Merriman has got all of the principals home safe. Simon and Barney are asleep, but Jane cannot sleep. She's got her cocoa and is now watching the dark attack from the sea and the people in the town react. We got Vikings and other types of people running around, and Jane is Jane opened her window because she saw a building on fire and is so entranced by the illusion that she did not realize there were no actual there was no actual heat or burning down on the quay side as if they saw nothing that had happened from the beginning will and merriman stood cloaked and still cavalry jane shrieked she could think of nothing but that the fire might reach the cottages cavalry then the noise outside the sky was suddenly gone altogether gone and she heard her own voice and found that what she had felt as a high tremorous scream was no more than a whisper and as she sat watching, disbelieving, the flames died and disappeared, and the red glow in the sky faded away. There was no more blood, nor any trace of it, and everything in the harbor of Truessic was as if the red-headed ravening, ravening men from the sea had not come. Somewhere a dog howled in the night. Cold, frightened, Jane clutched her dressing gown tighter around her. She longed to fetch Simon, yet she could not take her eyes from the window. Still unmoving, the cloud choked the the cloud cloaked the figures of Will and Merriman. Still unmoving, the dark cloaked figures of Will and Merriman stood over the edge of the sea. They made no sign of having noticed anything that had happened. There was a glimmering, glittering sheen on the water of the harbor, and Jane saw that over her head the moon had floated free of the clouds. A different light brightened as the world, cold but gentle. A different light brightened the world, cold but gentler, all was black and white and gray, and into it, out of the air, came a voice. It was not a man's voice, but thin and unearthly, chanting one sentence three times on one high, heart-catching note. The hour has come, but not the man. The hour has come, but not the man. The hour has come, but not the man. Jane peered all round the harbor, could see no one, only the two unmoving figures below. Again, the dog howled somewhere unseen. Again, she felt a strange buzzing humming in the air. And then she began to hear other voices crying far off in the village. The lottery! She, the lottery! She thought they cried. Then a man's voice clearer. The lottery is taken! Roger Toms! Roger Toms! Hide them! Bring them to the caves! The revenuers are coming! A woman sobbed. Roger Toms! Roger Toms! A harbor filled with people milling about anxiously, staring out to sea, scurrying to and fro. This time, Jane thought she could see the faces in the crowd. They were like the faces of Truisic that she knew. Penhallows, Palks, Hoovers, Tregarans, Thomases, all anxious, all perplexed, casting fearful glances both to sea and land. They seemed to have no real contact with one another. They were like sleepwalkers, sleep runners, folk desperately turning about in a bad dream, and a great shriek went up from the whole crowd as the last specter came rushing at them from the sea. It was not horrible, yet it was more heart stopping than any. It was a ship, a black ship, a single mast a single masted, square rigged single masted, square rigged, with a dinghy behind. Silent and unnerving, it came gliding into the harbor from the sea, scarcely touching the water, skimming the surface of the waves. It carried no crew, not a single form moved anywhere on the black de on its black decks, and when it reached the land it did not stop, but went on, sailing silently over harbor and rooftops and hill, away out of Truessic to the moors. And as the phantom ship swept away, with it all signs of life, the crowd vanished too. Jane found she was clutching the edge of the window sill so hard that her fingers hurt. She thought miserably, This is why he wanted us to sleep safe and empty with a blanket over our minds. That's where he wanted us, and instead I am in the middle of more nightmares than I ever imagined I could come in one night. And the worst nightmare of all is that I am awake. Nervously she peeped round the curtain again. Merriman and Will strode to the center of the quay. A third figure, cloaked and hooded, joined them. The other sat from the other side of the harbor, standing very tall, facing the village and hills, Merriman raised both arms in the air, and although nothing could be seen, it was through a great wave of it was as though a great wave of rage came roaring at them, 
rearing over them out of the dark, haunted village of Truisic. Jane could stand no more of it. With an unhappy little moan, she dived across the room and into her bed. Tight over her head, she pulled the covers and lay there, stuffy and shivering. She was not afraid for her own safety. Merriman had promised her that the cottage was protected, and she believed him. Nor was she afraid for, the, for those figures down in the harbor. If they had survived so strange a succession of monstrosities, they could survive anything. In any case, nothing could harm Merriman. It was another fear that possessed Jane, a dreadful horror of the unknown, of whatever force was sweeping through land and sea out there. She wanted only to cower into her own corner, animal-like, away from it, safe. And this she did, and found oddly that because the fear was so large and formless, it proved more ready to go away. Gradually Jane stopped shivering, grew warm, her taut limbs relaxed, she began to breathe slowly and deeply, and then she slept. And that's the end of chapter 10.